So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the panel which would be dedicated to the role of religion in defense of democratic governance. My name is Ivana Noble. I'm a professor of ecumenical theology at Charles University here in Prague. I will be moderating the session. And we have very distinguished guests. Uh, Paul Zulener, who is a theologian and a sociologist of religion from Vienna University in Austria. Very warm welcome. Uh, Suleiman Salim Nasser Al Husseini uh, from uh, Academy and University of Nizwa in Oman. Welcome. Uh, Akil Bilgrami, Professor of Philosophy of Columbia University in India and in the United States. Very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, Paul Klitter, philosopher, professor in Leiden University in the Netherlands. Welcome, Paul. And Nafisa Al Sabah, journalist and editor in chief of the Maserite website in Egypt. Welcome. Uh, and the program will be that first each of the panelists will have a short response to the main theme. Then there will be a possibility to discuss uh, their views among themselves. And then there will be the space open for the discussion from the plenary. I hope that we will have a very fruitful time. So please, uh, Paul, if I may ask you to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, me, I am a theologian on the one hand and a sociologist for religion on the other hand, so I am the personalized dialogue between religion and uh, democracy. And always when I am thinking something in my theological discipline, there is somebody show, looking over my shoulder and is asking me, is this true? Is this mm -hmm. really true? Can you say this? And so, in respect to our issue now, I, I'm afraid that I have to say there is no, not so much hope that religion is supporting democracy. I'm giving you an historical example from my church. I'm speaking for my church because there are others for uh, other religions. I'm uh, speaking for the Roman Catholic Church. And it was in the year 1864. The Pope at that time was Pius IX. He had the government for the Kirchenstaat, the, the church state, yeah. and he was uh, suppressed or oppressed by the liberal military from France. And at this time, he wrote this very famous uh, syllabus errorum. Syllabus errorum, it's uh, a putting together of 18 sentences of heresies, yeah, which the Pope couldn't accept at that time. I give you two examples which are uh, important for our discussion now. In number 15, the Pope wrote it is up to every man to accept and to confess that religion which he, led by the light of the reason, regards as true. Yeah? And he says, this is a heresy. It's not allowed for a theologian to teach it. Yeah? This means there is no freedom of consciousness, no freedom of religion. And if you read the last sentence, the number 80, it's like a summary. Can, he says the Roman Pope can and must reconcile and unite himself with the progress, the liberalism, and today's civilization. So he refuses all what was modern. He was totally anti-modern, anti-democratic, anti the freedoms of religion, of consciousness, of expression, and so on. And it took for my church <coughs> about 100 years that in the Second Vatican Council, the bishops said, no, no, it is freedom the basis for believing. Yeah? Without freedom, you can't really believe it's impossible. It's the, the famous 
the famous uh, scripture from Dignitatis Humanae. We should see the situation. The situation 1864 was a total other than 1964. Yeah? Because 1864, uh, the church was besieged by liberalism. Huh? In 1964, the Catholic Church was suppressed in many countries in Europe by communist totalitarianism. Huh? And this is the first idea I have for our discussion. It's not possible to speak about religion in itself, huh? but you have always to respect the context in which religion happens uh, and for what it is used. Uh, and as a sociologist of religion, I say mostly it's used for religious legitimation. When I learned by Thomas Luckmann <laughs> already in uh, 1969, my sociology of religion, he wrote together with Peter Berger the famous book, The Social Construction of Reality. And they said, whole society is a construction of human beings, uh, and it must be legitimated that it could be stabilized. And the legitimation on the first level is the language, then on the second level, level are myths and fairy tales and religion. Uh, and religion obscures that human beings have constructed society. They have hidden it. Yeah? So it couldn't be changed because if the emperor, the Roman emperor said, I am reigning by grace of God, it was impossible yeah, to attack him because this was not only a political revolution, but the greatest sin you can imagine. Yeah? So immunization by religious uh, legitimation is very normal. So that's the, my first story about the Pope, and therefore it's not easy to say religion, my religion, Christianity, was always supporting democracy. That's not true. That's really not true. I have a total other story happening in the year 1979. And this was already in, it's very short, yeah? This was already in uh, the communist time when John Paul II was in Warsaw, and this was the time of Jaruzelski, martial law, and he had a homily on the place of the victory in the center, and he said, who bends his knee in front of God, never again bends it in front of the party. Yeah, you see? So religion in this case is, re, is connecting people back to God, and uh, it's impossible to have a totalitarian access to the person by the political power. So religion for John Paul II was very anti-totalitarian. Yeah? And this is the good example for defending democracy, because democracy is the opposite to the totalitarian systems. I can explain it afterwards a little more, but it's enough now. Thank you very much, Paul. And now we will move to Suleiman Salim Nasser Al Husayni, please. Um, is religion in defense of democracy? I really think that the answer to this question is not yes or no. It can be yes, it can be no. It depends. Depends on how religion is interpreted and how religion teachings are uh, implemented and practiced in reality. Um, if I talk about uh, Islam as a religion, that's, that's my religion and that's, that's where I come from. Uh, so that I am not a religion uh, person, I do not belong to the uh, relig uh, religion institute, uh, but I am interested in religion in general. Uh, Islam is divided between two sources. The first sources, the main sources, are the Quran itself and the traditions uh, of Prophet Muhammad uh, and the practices that relate to him. This is one, one group. The second group is that 
how scholars from different schools of Islamic schools and different uh, centuries as well throughout Islamic history, how they have interpreted the teachings of Islam from those two main sources. So, um, to, to, my, to myself, really, I can see that uh, the, teachings, the, the teachings of Islam, as they are in the Quran and the Prophet saying, and practice, practices as well, they do not conflict with the values of uh, de democracy. So, in this case, Islam teachings do not conflict with, uh, with the values of democracy, so that, I mean, de democracy in the, uh, I mean, uh, it is, I mean, in the current sense, it is a new, new term, new terminology. It doesn't go back, for example, to 14 centuries uh, ago to when uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, lives and when the Quran was, uh, I mean, uh, written and stated. Uh, but the values that are embedded in Quran and in the practices and traditions of Prophet Muhammad do not a conflict with values of, the, of current democracy. Uh, therefore, I really say that yes, Islam can support, can support democracy. Uh, it doesn't conflict with Islam, doesn't conflict with democracy. So is, uh, democracy values, I don't know to what, I mean, what version of democracy can be implemented, but I really think it can be implemented in the Islamic world. Democracy can be implemented in the Islamic world and uh, does not conflict with the teachings of Islam. And uh, Muslim minorities living in democratic countries in Europe and other, in North America and other parts of the world, they really uh, can enjoy, can. Uh, enjoy the, uh, the opportunities that is provided by a democracy without any conflict, without, with, with, without any should be conflict between democracy and their, uh, their, their religion and their teachings uh, of Islam. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed for a very short but very firm and precise uh, introductory uh, presentation and he will meet, move now to Professor Akiel Bilgrami, please. So our theme is the relationship between religion and democracy and I want to begin with that there's a deeper point to be made but, but I'll make it later if, in the discussion if time allows. But I want to start with <coughs> uh, a relatively uh, a point on the surface, and that is when we talk about religion today in the polity, in politics, our main concern for all of us, what is most on our mind, is the extremist elements in many religions that have entered our political lives. This is just on everybody's mind, so we might as well speak about it. Now, the first thing to observe, which everyone observes, even George W. Bush after September 11th observed it, was he said that the extremists and the fundamentalists are a very small minority in any religion, including Islam. So this is a fact that everybody agrees about, that most religious people are not extremists and fundamentalists. Okay, so once we make that observation on which everybody seems to be agreed, then it seems to me that the relevance of democracy becomes very clear. And that is that if a very small minority amongst a religious population is extremist or absolutist, or fundamentalist, then it must be, it can only be democracy which shows that they are a very small and unrepresentative group. Because the point of democracy is to calibrate numbers with what is to be the representative voice, right? So if you can democratize religious communities, that would show 
that this group is not the representative voice of the religion because it's a very small group. So a question arises, how can we democratize religious communities? That is, how can we introduce representative institutions within a religion? Because if one did, one could show that this group is not the representative voice of the religion. But this is a question that almost nobody, no political theorists, no political sociologists, certainly no policy makers, have really paid attention to. How can we bring in intra-community, intra-community democracy? You see, when we talk about democracy, we have and representative institutions, elections, and so on. We, we talk about the federal level, the national level. We talk about the regional or the state level. We talk about the municipal representative and elections, and so on. But we have no idea how to talk about representative institutions within a religious group or community. And that, I think, is a question that we ought to raise seriously, that we ought to theoretically and practically address because that would be one way of removing from uh, re the fundamentalists and extremists the representative voice. Because part of the problem today is that people who are a very small group tend to become the representative voice because they make the loudest noise, the media pays attention to them, and therefore the state has to pay attention to them, and so they become a very much more visible element in the in the polity than they deserve to be, given their numbers. And only democratization within the community could reveal that. But we don't know how to think about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can already see some possible connections and questions. Uh, I think uh, when we speak about the point of democracy and the reality of democracy with the sociologist looking behind our back, as we might have heard in the first presentation, uh, the very strong emphasis that the democracy can be implemented in the Islamic world, but then also the challenge how to introduce democracy into the religious communities, into the majority of them which is not extremist and which is not fundamentalist. And I look forward very much to going to these issues later on. But we still have two other presenters to start with, so Paul Clitter is the next one, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, um, it's, uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here on this uh, wonderful, wonderful conference. This is not uh, of Forum 2000. Thank you for organizing this. Um, the general theme of this uh, conference is uh, strengthening democracy in uncertain times. And the title of this particular venue refers to the specific instrument of one, one uh, instrument in in particular, and that is religion. But it's religion with a question mark on our program. And um, my contribution is, is well, more of a of the skeptical nature. I'm the skeptic voice. Um, and I think we first have to interpret the question a little bit. Religion in defense of democratic governance, what could that mean? I think you can roughly make a distinction between two approaches. Um, there are two, two, two ways to give meaning to this question. And the first one would, 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 would be the, what I'm inclined to, uh, to call the, the historical, empirical dimension. Uh, um, take France. Um, there you have, it's a Catholic country. Now, what's the contribution to, to, of, of Catholicism to, to, to democracy? Or what has been the historical contribution? Paul already referred to that. Uh, you can uh, look at uh, another country, Saudi Arabia. They, ha they have the, the state's religion of, of Islam. Did Islam make a contribution to uh, democracy in, 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 in the history of that specific country? Or uh, perhaps you think my, my examples may be, may be suggestive, or perhaps unfair. And we, we can also look to Indonesia, huh? the, a very big country, huh? the largest Muslim country in the world. Was religion, in, 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 in this case Islam, was that conducive to democratic government there? 
Um, uh, this would be a uh, historical um, uh, type of, re of, of, of research. And I think, well, although I've not done that type of research, I, I, I think that, that in general, um, uh, uh, religions have not made it great contribution to democratic thought, I think. And I have an explanation for that. I think that democracy is ultimately based on the validity of individual human judgments. Religions, at, at least this is the case of the, of the monotheist religions, are based on the idea that divine law supersedes human law. So that's the complete opposite. Democracy is based on individual autonomy and on the notion that man makes law from, for, for, uh, for himself, while some of the religious, at le religions, at least the monotheist religions, are um, uh, based on a completely different conception. Now, that's the historical side. You can also say, no, we have to approach it from a, a more idealistic and philosophical, philosophical angle. Huh? And, and then you can say, well, uh, religion is in a sense the eye of the, in the eye of the beholder. We can, we can do with religion what we want. We can define religion the way we want. Uh, religion is morality tinged with emotion, Matthew Arnold said in the 19th century, a literary critic. Um, well, from that idealistic uh, perspective, there, are, uh, there is more hope, of course. There is more hope that it can support democracy. But then, I think there, I'm a bit skeptic as well, because we have the principle of freedom of expression and freedom of religion as very important principles. And what does that mean? What does the enshrinement of the principle of the freedom of religion in the Universal Declarations of Human Rights mean uh, in the, in the post-World War situation. That is, that we cannot use religion anymore for political purposes. It's the end of the whole notion of a state religion. Henry VIII could use, of course, Anglicanism to support his policies. But after the Second World War, we think that religion is something for the individual believer to decide upon. And then it would be a bit strange to say, well, we're going to use your religion for our political purposes. So that's not only something that dictators do, and, and that not only something that happens in totalitarian societies, but it, it, it's also something that's looming in democratic societies. So that's the problem. And therefore, I think that the better solution to this whole problem, that is strengthening democracy by democracy itself. Huh? A complete separation of church and state, secularism as a constitutional doctrine. Uh, you can have faith in democracy, in human rights, in the rule of law, and there is nothing to be won from perusing religious traditions in sort of support for our contemporary values. It doesn't add anything to the theory of the separation of powers when you say, well, that's, that's also there in the Hebrew Bible, or it's also there in the, in the New Testament, or it's also there in this hadith or that hadith, or this surah or that surah. It doesn't add anything, I think, to the democracy democratic ideal as such. So let's legitimate democracy on a purely human basis, on the, on the basis of human autonomous judgment and not referring to certain religious commands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. You promised to be provocative and so you were. Oh, uh, but you were provocative in the <laughs> was, land was not meant to be. where <laughs> secularism used to be the state ideology and when secularism started to behave as religion already. So I think we will move later on to some difficult waters of that. But before we do that, we have the last but not least presenter, uh, Nafisa al Saba, please. Um, Good afternoon for everyone. Thanks for having me here and giving me this chance to be among us too. Um, for the topic of today's actually, um, I'm coming from the most volatile area in the world. I'm from the Middle East, I'm Egyptian. Um, and I see the way religion has been used actually to turn the human being's life into hell. So I think religion is something that would be really important on the individual level, that makes people feel peaceful, feel better about themselves, have more courage or energy to go through their daily life with some hope. 
but on the political level, it's really dangerous and it's very catastrophic to use religion because it's... We see what happened. We have actually thousands of interpretation, for example, in Islam, for every single verse in the Quran. If 10 persons have read the verse, they can have 10 different interpretations. So on the human level, on the daily life, it can be really nice. It can be sort of rethinking what's religion, what's the interpretation of it, how to make our life better using it or walking in the light of it. But using it as a political instrument, it, it re actually it reaches this, uh, the, the situation we are in. So if we have before the crisis of uh, Daesh or what is called the Islamic State, uh, we had um, Israel in, in the Middle East as a Jewish state. So this thesis actually of talking about a state for a certain religious is very dangerous. I, I think it contributed to strengthening Hamas as an opposition or struggle that's based on religion as well, confronting the state, the occupation that's raised on, based on another religion. So it had this kind of bad effect on the kind of moving away from a secular uh, movement to resist the occupation into a religious resistance to the occupation. And when things went more and so many governments thought that the only organized force in the region that could replace the old regime is the Islamic forces and they invested in supporting them, it reached to in what we are seeing now in this sense. So this kind of using religion so intensively in politics and in everything that talks about the daily life, made it really bad and ended up with having those, all those bloods and all those wars uh, around us. I think it's something similar to the medieval ages when the church was leading everything, or in other words, another religion leading and making everything based on the decisions or whatever God says. So now, we are getting into this era again with a different religion. So it's sort of blood. So actually anything that's considered divine or infinite cannot be part of whatever is really human. So let's separate, let's leave what is, what is infinite and what's not very easy to discuss to the personal beliefs. And then do not just link the human way of organizing their lives and ruling themselves and governing uh, their political life to whatever that so many people consider sacred. Regardless, there's so many different interpretation of this sacred thing. So I don't think at all that religion can have any contribution to democracy. It can have contributions on the individual levels, but it will have very disastrous effect if used as an instrument in politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, You're Nafisa. Welcome. I could feel in what you said the pain which you feel uh, when you follow what is happening in your countries and in many other countries where actually the extremism moved to the field of politics and that it moves beyond so-called experiment of the minority and it becomes the state ideology. And yet I think uh, we can be aware that we are facing different crises here. Not only the crisis of the democratic governance, but at the same time also the crisis of religion in its uh, institutional and doctrinal formulation. Uh, I think spirituality for most of us would be okay. 
But what is the role of religion, including this institutional dogmatic side of each religion uh, in relation uh, to democratic governance? Is religion an end? No, it's not. Is democracy an end? No, it's not. But to what are they means for? And how can we help this relationship to cultivate a meaningful, full and free living? But I'm not going to give another talk, don't worry, because I would want to give a space now to you responding to each other. So whoever wants to start, please put your hand up. Mm -hmm, please. So I agree with uh, Paul and, and, uh, and I said... Uh, Which Paul? Paul Peter. <laughs> uh, we, we, I think we're both uh, atheists, so... <laughs> Um, but I want to be—I want to try and be a little more sympathetic than than his skepticism, despite our agreeing on on uh, uh, on the nature of religion and the nature of modernity and secularism and so on. Let Let me begin by Paul. Uh, I'm partly addressing you, but but making a general point for everyone. Let me get into what I want to say by asking what makes the difference today between Europe, let's say Western Europe, and the United States in the matter of religion in society. I was in a church in Paris. I, I like, despite being an atheist and a secularist, I like sitting in churches because it's very peaceful and, and so I do that from time to time when I'm visiting different places. And I was in a church on a Sunday in Paris, a very large church, as large as larger than this room, and there were three people there on a Sunday. If I were in a church in Kansas on a Sunday, there would be 3,000 people in it. That's a tremendous difference. Now, why is that so? I think an explanation for why Western Europe has been so deeply secularized is that for about over a hundred years now, there has been a very strong social democratic tradition of labor politics in Western Europe which has brought about many changes, which has brought about social democracies in, in, these, uh, in that part of the world. And labor politics provided unions and labor halls in which, to, which people went three or four times a week. If you look at Britain, for instance, labor unions met three or four times a week and people went, and that is the site where people found the community and solidarities with one another as human beings that used to exist in going to church. In the heartland of the United States, where there's almost a frenzied religious pervasiveness, there are no unions. There is no social democratic tradition. So part of what makes Western Europe so different from the United States, I think, is that people's yearnings for solidarity and community with one another Human, a human yearning is provided at different sites, at no longer the church, because of a very strong social democratic tradition of the last hundred years. That's simply missing in the United States. Now, if that is so, then quite apart from what Paul and I agree about, which is skeptical of a whole range of, of <coughs> divine laws and, and uh, other claims of of religious texts, whether it's the Quran or the Bible. And, uh, it's, the fact is that religion in society is a source of providing community and solidarity. Now, what has this got to do with democracy? Well, one thing, I'll, I'll say this quickly, I'm sorry I've been speaking too long. See, one of the things about the enlightenment and democracy and so on is that we have introduced two great values of freedom and equality, liberty and equality. 
But we haven't really paid much attention to the third ideal of the slogan, which is fraternity. And that is not something that comes with codes and constitutions. That comes with a kind of the what happens in social life. It can't just be presented through codes and constitutions and formal protocols of democracy. It needs something else. It needs to remove alienation from society. It needs to, to bring in wider uh, senses of community and and that's what the ideal of fraternity was meant to be. But it was never made into a, a, an ideal that, that could be implemented through the protocols or the codes and constitutions. So what one needs is to, I think, not just reduce human beings to citizens through notions of the constitutions. It's fine, you absolutely need law and constitutions, but you need a wider thing which was being gestured at by the notion of fraternity. And I think the secular version of religion must seek to make democracy more capacious so that we get what would otherwise be provided by the church. And that's something I don't think when we when we theorize about democracy, when we think about democracy more deeply, we, we have reduced it to codes and constitutions and we have not paid attention to this wider thing. And that, I think, is something we can learn from what religion means to people in their ordinary lives. Even if we are atheists, we can believe that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Any more comments? Please. Well, <coughs> there is... I think another explanation for the difference between United States and Europe, and there are a lot of studies by Grace Davy or Peter Berger, you know these sociologists, and they were saying this is a, a consequence of a terrible history in Europe for 500 years. Uh, it is a consequence of this bloody war the Thirty Years' War, which started here in Prague by the defenestration of the delegates of the Habsburg's empire and lasted for 30 years. And this was the combination between religion and political power. And I think God was misused for political fights and wars. Huh? And this is one reason that then, many years later, Voltaire came in France and said, couldn't we have a religion without churches? Écraser les femmes. Destroy these infamed churches. And then came atheists and said, no, 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 uh, freedom, uh, solidarity, and all these democratic issues are much better when we have atheism without any religion. Yeah? And this is the typical European uh, de development in, in the cultural dimension, I'm afraid. You are, you are right, we have uh, a, a very elaborated social state in Europe, it's a difference to America too, so that the American communities can do much more for its members than an Austrian community, community can do now. Yeah? And this is the difference. But may I, I put the focus to, a, to another um, dimension of our problem? Because uh, democracy and rel religion both are serving society, is my, my impression. Yeah? So it's not only the relation between religion and, and democracy, but both are serving society. And one of the main challenges in our societies is fear in Europe now, even in America. I read the book from Dominic Moisey, is an expert for political sciences, and he says in Chindia, that's India and China together, there is a region of hope. Uh, the Arabic world is a region of humiliation, that's very interesting. Yeah? And the American and the European world are regions of fear now. And I remember the the statement from Roosevelt, the president, the third, third, second, I think so, uh, he said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Huh? And this is a very political problem now because 
fear destroys solidarity, fear uh, claims for strong leaders, uh, fear is the basis for the right-wing movement in Europe now. Uh, so fear is totally anti-democratic. Look at, at all countries and in all service, we, we see if there is any fear, the people start to become anti-democratic. Huh? So my question is, not that religion should uh, directly support democracy, but I am thinking which resources does democracy have to heal this fear, this anti-democratic fear? And this is not a question of ethics. It's not possible to do it with laws. But is it possible to say this has to do with religion? Because religion is the source of real trust. Huh? And is the opposite to, ain't, ain't to be anxious, to the German anger, the angst. Huh? So that's my question I, I would like to, to put in this our discussion. Is perhaps a very indirect uh, uh, service of religion to uh, support democracy in our times, that uncertain times are for me times of fear. Huh? That's mm -hmm. the, the, the most important <coughs> position I will put in our, <coughs> sorry, our discussion. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you very I much. What I said earlier does not conflict with, with my colleagues here are saying about that religion should, should nothing to do with democracy and the improvement of democracy. <coughs> but that, I mean, uh, uh, face us with a practical challenge, especially when we talk about religious societies. It is okay when we talk about secular societies, it, we can say... Um, from the beginning that the religion has nothing to do with democracy and democracy should be uh, democracy democratic improvements should be isolated from religion but how can you convince how can we convince uh, religious societies that uh, religion does not conflict with uh, any democratic improvements and developments. This is really, this is why I said that uh, the, the answer to the real, uh, to the original question is not yes uh, or no. It, can't, it can be yes, it can be no. Uh, this is why I really think that for religious societies, I mean, in, in order to introduce democrat, democratic values to the to them and to, the, to, a democrat, uh, to a religious society. It has to be integrated, it has to be step by step. It has as well to come from within the, uh, the society. It cannot be imposed, imposed to them. And this is the, the reality in the Middle East right now when uh, international powers try to impose uh, democracy on some specific countries in the Middle East. The, 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 the people didn't accept it, and it was not done smoothly. It turned into wars, internal wars and external wars as well. So I really think, I still think that uh, when we talk about Islam, for example, I really think that within Islam, there, there are possibilities to convince people, to say to people, yes, Islam does not conflict with uh, democracy, and uh, within Islamic teachings, there are many principles, many values, which do, uh, uh, which do agree with uh, democratic uh, values and the democratic uh, improvements. So we can utilize religion f to, achieve, uh, uh, to achieve democratic uh, improvements and developments within non-democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Al Husseini. And I think he we reached another really very important point that uh, religions perhaps also uh, for out of their experience and out of their tradition of wisdom, uh, they can maybe criticize what is done with democracy, not the idea of democracy, but with the reality of democracy. Uh, when it is imposed on people or, or when democracy like we experience it in our countries turn into what Plato criticized, uh, to the ruling of the people who are moved by the populist winds whichever way they go. And maybe this is, I think, another aspect of the theme which we also may need to take into account. Like uh, what uh, uh, Paul Zulener was speaking about when he said that uh, perhaps 
religions can help in counteracting the fear in the society because they have experiences of trust. But we can move further in the discussion, please. Um, actually, on regarding the use, be using religion in, in different positive ways, still, it's too dangerous with what I see. Uh, if it's working on the social level, it's, it's really calming and it's really helpful because it's part of the people one way or another, especially in, in the Middle East, it's part of the people. So using it on a social level, for example, if there is some sectarian tensions, if there is some conflicts, some need for volunteering, some need for donation. If using the religion in this kind of sense, as human beings are asked, for, for example, for, uh, at, at the first level, as human being, and at the second level, as the believers in one religion, it would be very helpful. But if using it to promote or uh, attract some point of view against some policies, here lies the real danger, actually. Because if today I'm using it for a good policy that's really serving the majority of the people in this country, at some point tomorrow maybe come someone else who is using it just to dilute people, to make them just move to the other direction, which is totally against the rights and the interests of the majority of people. So actually, I think, yes, religion is a very important, integrated part of the majority of the human being's life till now. But let's keep it on the social level more and cultural level more than on the political level. It's very dangerous if we do it on the political level. This does not mean that democracy or any improvements or any developments in any community all over the world can be imposed from, by any force from outside. Mm -hmm. It should come from inside by the people, but it should not be sold to the people based on a religious basis. For example, in Egypt, the majority of people need more freedom, yes, of course. But if they felt that this freedom would be linked to any international force. Here comes actually the way where religion can be used to hijack against this kind of development, even if it is uh, supposedly to be good at the end. So it's two different things, actually, using religion on the social level to make people less fearful, to make them more assured, to make them think twice about fellow human beings who could be different, but they are not definitely be dangerous. There are some minority who are really dangerous, yes, of course. And on the other hand, it cannot be used to promote politics. And one way or another, politics is not accepted at all to be imposed by force or by manipulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for reminding us that religion is not a political program. I think that this is something which maybe we can see in different contexts. But that there would be differences still, I think. And I think that there is an important question. What is part of our human condition? And what is part of a particular religion? Uh, again, coming from the country which has long experience with the non-religious absolutes and with the institutions which would behave in exactly the same totalitarian manner. The, ins the religions we criticize now can behave today. Uh, I would be, I think, skeptical to think that if we move religion out of the public sphere, that these problems will go with it. I think they won't. Mm -hmm. but I think that's, uh, now you... Oh, yeah, the mic is working. I, I, I think you, you introduced something different now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we have to make a, a very uh, clear separation between uh, state religion and religion being visible in society, or what is called the mm -hmm, public yes. fear. That's totally different. So people have individual freedom of religion, and on the basis of that individual freedom of religion, you get religious plurality. And I'm 
inclined to think, and, that's then, and, and then I uh, refer to what um, uh, Mr. Bill Grammy uh, said, that, that um, Europe at this moment in time is in a certain sense ahead of the United States of America in the sense that um, there is much more religious plurality, uh, pluralism, uh, diversity in Europe than in the United States of America. In the United States of America, the overwhelming majority of the people supports religion. Uh, the overwhelming majority uh, of the people is very much opposed uh, uh, against atheism. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Mr. Bill, Bill Graham may not be an outcast at uh, uh, Columbia University, but in s American society at large, atheists, all the polls say, is, is one of the most hated minorities. That's strange, and, and that's also a problem, I think, um, for the uh, American mentality towards uh, freedom of religion. Um, uh, I also want to make a, make a remark on, um, uh, on, on the concept of religion. We, we, we use that in a, in a very loose way, so religion. Uh, but there is a big difference, of course, between religions. You have, on the one hand, a pantheism uh, of Spinoza, and you have a belief in witchcraft, and you have New Age. But you also have the three monotheist religions. And what worries me a little bit, and I uh, support uh, um, uh, my um, colleague from Egypt in, 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 in that sense, what w worries me a little bit, that in some religions you have that political ambition. Mm -hmm. You do not have that in New Age thinking. And that's also completely unfitted to support political programs. But in Judaism, uh, Christianity, and, is, and, and in is Islam, you have a certain political ambition. And Paul already referred to that when he referred to the syllabus errorum of, of, the, of the Pope. Nowadays, Catholicism has developed into a, in, into a non-political religion. But 150 years ago, it was an extremely political religion with the ambition also to seize state power. And that's th something we have, to be on our, uh, we have to be on our guard against those kind of, uh, of, of, of pretensions. And that starts small. Therefore, I'm, I'm more worried about radicals but perhaps than um, uh, um, uh, Cahill, uh, when he refers to, to the minority within the religious fold, which may be true, but all the bad things start with minorities. And if minorities have a mooring in religious traditions, that's something to be uh, skeptical about. Then my last remark. Religion can be used as a, as a tool for social cohesion, but not as a tool for national cohesion. It's always a tool to support cohesion in a certain group. But in religious diverse societies, when you have a, a nation with, with, with Muslims and Christians and Jews and Buddhists and Hindus, then it's all, always cohesion within the group we're talking about. But it's always undermining the social cohesion of the polity at large. And what we, what we need now in, in nation states, we need a new narrative that supports uh, living together uh, on the territory of the, of, the, of the different states in harmony with each other, in tolerance with each other. And, and I'm afraid that religion is not the right instrument to stimulate that mentality. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to respond to that? Well, one sentence only. Uh, Paul, you said that the Catholic Church is very unpolitical now. And I, I'm in doubt of this because if I follow what the Pope now is teaching, for instance, in Laudato Si about ecological problems, these are political world problems. And he has a very clear position in these problems, huh? even in, in economical questions, when he says that these economic, this one, the real one now, is uh, killing people. This is a political statement, of course. Yeah. So I'm quite sure that uh, he is political, but he is not a part of the politics. Uh, that's the difference, I, I think. He's a part of the society, of the global society, but not a part of a political uh, tradition or something else. And yeah. this is 
I, I think a, a very good result of what we have learned in the last 500 years in uh, Europe, because in the pre-modern time, religion and state was so uh, narrowly linked yeah, that it was disastrous for the, for, the, for the peace in Europe. And we learned what I call the benign secularization, yeah, to separate the political sphere from the religious sphere on the political level, but not in society. And therefore, I think it's for the concept of democracy very important, not only look to the level of the state, but to the level of society, the, the non-governmental organizations. And, and see, I, I think there is the place for the churches now. They're, they make their social and their political work. And this, I, I think, could be helpful for democratic societies. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move to you, Akil, uh, would you like maybe Nafisa to respond to that? Because I think it comes from different and also to what you were talking about. <coughs> Actually, it's, I think it's, it's pretty much the, the, the case. I would just totally mm -hmm. agree with, mm -hmm. with, with the remark. I just, you know, religious leaders being a part of giving a point of view about politics and what affects the daily life of people is something, but actually wishing to rule mm -hmm. as politician is something else. So one way or another, religion individuals, whether they are individuals or, or leader in this religious or, or, or religion or that, they are part of the, the society, they are part of the community, so they feel the pressures that are there, so they need to discuss it and talk about it and have point of view about it, which is pretty much normal and needed and can be used in a, in a good way. But being actually the real ruler on the political level, this is the real danger. That's why actually having a religion in the public sphere is something that's not fearful. But making it part of the real politics and the ruling, this is the real catastrophe. Mm -hmm. yeah, state doctrine. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Akil, please. Well, you know, I tend to be skeptical of the need for the concept of national cohesion. That's not something, uh, that I think is a dangerous idea. Don't, let's not forget that the history of Europe since West, the Westphalian peace is a history in which nation building exercises took the form of religious majorities finding an external enemy within and saying the nation is ours, not theirs. That's the history of the rise of European nations since Westphalia. Right? It, that you, you claim that you find an external enemy within the territory, you say the nation is ours, not theirs. The Jews, the Jews. Irish in Britain, Muslims. the Protestants in Catholic, Catholic countries, Catholics in Protestant countries, now it's Muslims. And, and so, so that's the history of the idea of national cohesion and you find it now in populist national movements and so on. So, so I'm skeptical of the very need for the notion of national cohesion. I think that we need notions of community and solidarity in whatever form we can find them. And, and I, you see, for me, part of the problem is that with the idea of progress, we came to believe that there can only be criticism of tradition from the point of view of modernity. But we haven't given any scope for the idea that there might be. I'm not saying that there definitely is, but that there might be scope for finding criticism of modernity from the point of view of tradition. Maybe there is. And the, the reason why I was bringing in how by stressing liberty and equality, we left out fraternity in, the, in erecting codes and protocols of, of liberal democracy, is that 
it's a very interesting thing. So almost every political theorist agrees that alienation is a problem only of modernity. However defective pre-modern societies were, and they were very defective indeed, alienation was not a problem. Mm -hmm. People had a sense of belonging, even if it was oppressive in many, many ways, mm -hmm. which modernity has overcome, and that's, that's why modernity is something we all admire. But the fact nevertheless remains that alienation is a problem not of the pre-modern, but of the modern. And so the question arises, might we learn something about the possibilities of an unalienated life and therefore not be so self-congratulatory about our modernity? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. And I think your point about the fraternity, uh, the value which we have left behind uh, from the slogan of French Revolution, is just so important. How would that look in the Islamic context when you, uh, Dr. Al Husseini, spoke about the possibility of uh, uh, linking or introducing democratic principles also in the Islamic context? What would be the role of the uh, fraternity there? Of the brotherhood, which would be positive and which can help in the democratic governance in the Islamic world? Generally speaking, I really think that democracy is possible to introduce to the Islamic world and it does not, as I said, conflict with any, uh, uh, with any, uh, with any values and principles of Islam. But who should, I mean, be responsible for such improvements in terms of democracy? I really think it is the leaders, uh, the political leaders' uh, responsibility. It is rather than any uh, religious leader's responsibility. Because now, if, nowadays, if we look at the uh, Arabic or Muslim countries, generally speaking, we will find that most of the uh, revolutions, most of the uh, improvements, most of the development plans and so on are not coming from any le religious leaders or from any religious movements. They are coming from political leaders. And there is a kind of coalition uh, or agreements between sometimes between what politicians decide and what, uh, uh, politi uh, what religious leaders as well uh, agree, agree with. There, there are many agreements. Uh, so there is not that kind of conflict going on between politicians. Um, I should say that there is, I should acknowledge. But I mean, in, 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 normal, in normal situations, in normal countries, where there are no uh, conflicts, no wars and so on, there is agreement between what polit politician leaders decide and what the general people, including the... Uh, the religious uh, leaders or religious people uh, think should be taking place, there is agreement. So it is really the responsibility of the political leaders to introduce democracy into the uh, Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, would you like to respond also from your point of view on the missing fraternity in the society? When you said that religion can help social cohesion but not national cohesion, which I think is again something which echoes in our discussion. What would be the role of uh, the fraternity, this deep solidarity in the social cohesion? And how can it be strengthened by religion? And if so, what would be helpful and what would not be helpful in your opinion? Well, I think that it, in, in religiously pluralist societies, it, it, the first question that immediately uh, rises is, what religion? I mean, uh, let's, let's make it very practical. You, you are the, 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 the head of France or, or the head of Germany, and, 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 you, and you want to stimulate fraternity or, or, mm -hmm. or, or social cohesion uh, within your, your com 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 community. Um, what specific religion do you invoke? <laughs> I mean, uh, Protestantism, uh, Catholicism, um, uh, Christianity in general, uh, um, um, uh, Islam, Judaism, that's very difficult. Um, and, and what I see also in my country, the Netherlands, that, that politicians talk about religion in, in, in general, but when you ask what religion, then it then it's becomes very difficult and they do not know uh, what to say. 
So I, I, I think a better uh, and, and, and a more promising route would be trying to, to stimulate fraternity um, um, and cohesion on the, in, uh, within the nation state by referring to general values as uh, human rights. Uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights issued in, 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 in 1948 is, is in a sense a kind of successful world religion, if you want, in the, in the sense that the, 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 the human community, for the, for the, for the first time, time in, in world history presented a list of, 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 of rights and, and values that everyone could, could, uh, could, under, uh, could underline, could, could support. And uh, what was interesting, it was for the first time, it was based on a secular basis. It was based on nothing, nothing different than, than, than human nature, and you were referring to it, on human nature, not on one specific religion, but on human nature. And I think that we, we need such a, such a, um, a common, co a co a common uh, complex of values um, uh, in, in, in every nation state, I, I, I think. I know, of course, that the whole idea of national cohesion, and I, I refer to, to Cahill, it, it, it has, an, uh, an, well, to say the least, an unhappy uh, recent history, of course. Mm -hmm. huh? And it can uh, also develop in all kinds of uh, very nasty nationalism and inclusion, uh, ex exclusion of, of, of uh, uh, minorities. On the other hand, we, we need some moral support also for our constitutions, for our values. I mean, the, the American constitution has to be supported by, by the American people, uh, recognizing in that specific paper declaration something of a, of, 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 of a moral nature that they like. And, and we all have to support that, that moral foundation for the Constitution, mm -hmm. because otherwise it, 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 it will, 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 will mm -hmm. vanish, uh, it, it will lose its attractiveness, and uh, people um, yeah, will... will and and the, the nation state ca cannot, cannot continue to exist. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. Maybe I will also turn, if I can, to Nafisa, uh, speaking about the uh, brotherhood, uh, the, a woman coming from Egypt may have, I hope, still other connotation. How happy do you feel about the language concerning the brotherhood in your context? Yeah. And, and Egypt now, it's one way or another, it's there. This spirit is, is there, especially in the country's heights. Maybe it's not there in the big cities. And it's not definitely related to religion, by the way. It's related to being living together in the same place with the same conditions. For example, if a place that has a problem with electricity that's being repeated. So all of us have this kind of solidarity together because we have passed by the same experience together. This kind of cooperation in farming the land and helping each other in farming the land. So it's basically the daily social economic needs and the same experience creates this kind of uh, solidarity and feelings. So it's there. Maybe this is the, the thing that's coming from the old days that really need to be supported and continue alongside with modernity, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. And in my personal experience, it was not contradictory. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of uh, a strange person in my village, but still I was part of it. Mm -hmm. They did not exclude me and I did not look down after them or feel that I'm not part of them. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of just, you know, it's there. It cannot, it's not a must to be connected to religion. Mm -hmm. It can be connected to the same economic cultural situation. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, if it is connected this way, it would be even more being able to accept the differences, to accept some different interpretation for the same religion and to accept the coexistence among different people from different religion in the same area, having the same human experience at some era of time. So yes, religion can support, but still, it should not be the only thing that we are relying on. It depends on the situation itself. And actually, if there is sort of a unity of experience 
for a group of people, so there would be, if it's not being imposed either for religion reasons or for political reasons, people would just be more solid, have more solidarity together because they have faced the same experience together one way or another, in, in, in a very natural way, if we can describe it. So it's still there, it's, but actually I'm afraid of linking it to religion. And religion is part of it at some time. But it's time. not the only part. It's not the only element. That's important. Thank you very much. Oh. And now, does anybody or a few want to respond to anything else, please? Well, I, I'm, I'm very much enjoying this exchange with Paul because I think <laughs> we're, we're from, from within a common <laughs> framework. We, we're having these marginal uh, differences which is forcing us to refine what we... But, but, but it's very interesting, uh, Paul, that you, you raise the point about how we might gain feelings of, of community through notions of human rights. You see, my worry about that is it's just too abstract a notion to, to be the, the, the source of, of human bonds. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, take a notion like friendship. Take a notion like family, and religion falls within that kind of concept. Religion, family, friendship, etc. These are sources of community. Now, you take a notion of human rights, and it just doesn't have the same, uh, 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 the same element of, of being a source of bonding between people that people yearn. So, I, I don't want to exclude notions of friendship or family or religion and so on from social life in the name of an abstraction, which is what I meant by citizenship, reducing humanity to citizenship. So, so I, what I think we have to do is just acknowledge the importance of, of bonding notions like friendship and, and family and religion, and yet steer them away from the polity, in just the way that Nafisa was suggesting, when they really are a problem, create a problem for the polity. So, so I, I'm skeptical of abstractions being the source of, mm -hmm. of human mm -hmm. feeling. Thank you very much. And now I think uh, I will open uh, the questions to the floor, so if you have any questions to any of the speakers, please start. Yeah. Here first, lady in the first row, then in the third row. If you can say your name, maybe, and country, that may help. It's not working. Shall I shout? Um, I'm talk. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I'd like to your, know your definition of democracy. And to whom are you asking? <laughs> Any band. <laughs> Okay, so who wants to pick it up? Uh, Can we vote? <laughs> oh, well, the, 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 the democracy... The, I, the, I have the, a definition of democracy. The, the, so. Democracy has to do with um, um, uh, giving people some, 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 some power over government. Uh, people deciding from themselves who will be their leaders, their political leaders. Uh, political leaders who go away when when they do not do the things that that they want. That's my my problem with the Pope, uh, by the way. I, I I agree, of course, with 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 Paul that some of the some of the politics that that the present Pope um, um, engages in I, I I like, but from a democratic point of view, his his. De Democratic legitimacy is 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 not is not very uh, impressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's that's that. But uh, apart from that, but uh, that's roughly what uh, what what democracy uh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, would be. Okay. Thank you, uh, Akil. You also have a democracy. Oh, no, I think I've spoken too much. Others should should speak. I'll maybe later. Go ahead. No, no, say it. Say it. I, I don't <laughs> like to defend democracy. <laughs> Please. Well, you know. What, something one has to immediately say when asked about what the meaning of democracy is, is to say that it has two sides. It has a formal side and a procedural side, formal procedural side, which consists of law, constitutions, representative institutions, uh, electoral 
protocols and so on. And then there's the substantive side. And the substantive side of, of democracy is the idea that ordinary people, that is to say people away from centers of power and privilege, right, ordinary people should, through their decisions, be able to shape their material and spiritual lives, material and, and social lives, if you don't like the word spiritual. Um, so through, through their own decisions should be able to, to shape it. It should not be shaped by the state, by corporations, by institutions remote from the lives of ordinary people. Now that's the substantive side. And when I was saying you can't reduce human beings to citizens, I was basically saying that it has, democracy has more than a formal procedural side. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nyara Zomashe Amombe. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm a women's rights activist. Um, I have a few questions. I'll try to make them quick. Um, uh, somebody spoke earlier and said um, democracy, religion wouldn't probably uh, be as good for democracy. But we also have it on record that um, religion has actually in certain times uh, been a tool, uh, religious leaders rather, have been a tool used for mediation in, in times like war where there is uh, a lack of agreement uh, between tribes or countries. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in that sense uh, we need religion and maybe, I wouldn't say we need it, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a societal tool that's there that we may not be able to get rid of because people identify so strongly with it and they respect religious leaders. And then um, another one is, so that is the good part of religion and as far as democracy is concerned. But then I have two no, issues. I think we have only two questions maximum. Okay, so if all right. We can so the, the other question is, how do we un remove the oppression of women that is caused by religion? And in Africa right now, we have a problem of prophets, pro prophets who, use, who are being used by political leaders to prophesy their perpetual rulership. How do we deal with that? Thank you very much. So we have two really important comments. Would you like to start? I am really interested in the question regarding women, mm -hmm. uh, especially. Uh, and this is part of why I'm totally against using religion in the political, the direct political formal sphere of the state you know, as been for presidents or, uh, or ministers, as if they are breacher, this is too dangerous, especially for women. Because the majority of interpretation for different religious is making women inferior, making women come second after men, uh, and at some point after, after children, actually. So this is why actually, the policies have to be taken into, take into consideration the values of the human beings as citizen, as equal citizen. And then those citizens on the social ordinary level on the ground had the, had the right to choose, for example. If a woman thinks that she would not accept to work except unless her husband agrees, so it's her choice but it's not imposed by the state politics, by the law, according to the law. It's a personal and individual choice by this way, so I do respect it in, in this situation. But that's why actually laws and politics have to take so many steps away from religion when they are being drawn, and then individuals and different communities in different places should just um, go within those laws, maybe they can get rid or just voluntarily refuse part of their rights if they want 
If they do not want to vote, for example, you cannot force anyone to go voting. Mm -hmm. So you cannot uh, force every single woman to go to work. But now it's, we are making it back into the personal individual decisions. Uh -huh. Instead of just, you know, linking any new regulations or laws to Islam and, or Christianity or any religion and then said, this is our interpretation. So you will get out thousands of different interpretation and different points of view of different religions. And would be this all the time sort of a war between interpretation and a war between different religion regarding the law. So let's say that the laws and the constitutions and the politics are human uh, actions that can be right and can be wrong. Religion is about something that if you believe in, so it's absolutely right. No one can tell you it's wrong. No one can discuss it with you. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you really believe, you will not allow. But if we are talking about the laws uh -huh. as a term, as articles, so yeah, yeah. no, this uh -huh. is it, it's really dis more discussionable. I don't think I would understand <laughs> religion this way at all. But I think that this would be a matter of uh, discussion. But I would still want to come to the second point, which I thought was really important. And this was the mediating role of the leaders during the wars. No, Paul. I, I would like to say something to this second question, too, mm -hmm. because this okay. is a main problem within theology now. And this is a main problem for all religions which have holy books. Huh? And all fundamentalists are saying, what is written, this is true. And we have no good theory of inspiration. And my idea is, if I look in the book, there could be and will be, I'm quite sure, something which is true and we can say then, this is God given if it is true. Yeah? But who knows what is true then? And there are other parts uh, which are man-made. It's the ideas of the persons in this culture who have written the books. So in uh, the Bible you can read, women have to be silent in the church. This is not the message of God, it's my impression. Uh, if I make a good exegesis, I'm saying, well, this was normal at that time for a male society, male-dominated society, but this is over. We have to think what is true and what is uh, the, the pictures of that time. And you can't forget it, and you have to change it. And therefore, it is a main task for every theology to make a good exegesis of the holy texts of our religion. This is not easy, but it is important. <coughs> Thank you. Does anybody want to respond to the first question? I wouldn't want it to go under the table. Well, Only the first question. Oh. Yes? About basically, basically, I was talking about the first question. Yeah. I think the second question that's not answered was using religion in for example, stopping wars or... Yeah, this was yeah. the first question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's one way or another, it's a social tool as long as there are people, and it will be, I think, who, who are religious and believe in, in something. So it will continue to be a, a, a way to affect them to stop something, but it should not be a way to be used to erupt something, actually. And this is the real danger. So if there is a trouble and can be just settled down using religion versus... No, I think that the idea would be like the tribal wars and that a religious figure yeah. can actually act as a mediator in that situation. I, I think that's a very good point. I and, think and, and as an as atheist or secularist, I, I, I readily uh, concede that. It's, and it's yeah. also a very interesting yeah. question that you raise. I, I, I can very easily imagine that, that if you have a, uh, have a war between two mm -hmm. nation states who happen to support the same religion, that sensible people within yeah. those nation states yeah. can do, let's not make war because we all share Christian values 
values or, or, or Islamic values, whatever. I, I can understand that. Uh, there are also many, many examples of very laudable political um, campaigns supported and motivated by religion. One of the best examples is perhaps Martin Luther King, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who, who, who referred to the, to the Bible and, 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 uh, yeah. and, the, and, and the Jewish people, and he made a comparison, and, and, and all the, 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 the white rednecks in the, in the South. They had, to, they had to concede that they were Christians, and now you have uh, Martin Luther King out, out preaching them <laughs> with, their own, with their own Bible. That, that, that was really very interesting. And if my last example, if my, if, 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 if my, my daughter is hijacked somewhere in the Middle East or in, in, in mm -hmm. the Swat Valley in, in, in Pakistan, and, and to, get her, to get her out, I, I must advance arguments. You can hear me quoting all the surahs and the hadiths that are available. But that last remark, I want to make clear that I think that's the, it's the second best option. I mean, in some situations, you refer to religion as a kind of pragmatic tool. But it would be much better, I think, uh, perhaps it's idealistic. Perhaps uh, um, uh, Cahill will, will think it's, it's, it's too idealistic. But, but, but my, my ideals are that, that, that one day we, we will have a situation in, in the world where referring to ordinary uh, virtues and values would, would, would be sufficient to accomplish the same, um, the same ideals. Mm -hmm. uh, um, thank you. Um, um, I have a point of view regarding this question. Um, I think any conflicts uh, and wars and so on, it should be resolved according to international laws rather than uh, any laws invented by any religious groups or any religious leaders. Uh, when it comes to mediation, yes, we can, uh, I think it could, uh, um, different people, different uh, groups, different leaders can be used, utilized in order to mediate. But when it comes to laws, it has to be solved by international uh, laws. Now, nowadays, we see in the Middle East, for example, that religious leaders are contributing to the establishments of wars rather than to ending those wars. So it is the international law which should contribute and which should be the, f the final decision should be taken from international laws or even, I mean, national laws in order to stop wars and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I was reminded that we have the last five minutes, uh, so uh, there is time for one more question and then I will summarize things. So pl please, the lady in the first row. Hi everyone, my name is Sakhna and I'm from Senegal. And I have a question directed towards the topic of the panel which clearly says religion in defense of democratic governance. And I would like to ask the whole panel, we have a multitude of religions in the world. We have different sects. We have different interpretations of different religions. So in that case, with globalization and the way that our societies are constructed nowadays, what place, if any, does religion has in our politics? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, and we have uh, five minutes for that. <laughs> so we have uh, half a sentence each. <laughs> Actually, in politics, I think we don't have a place for religion. Thank you. I agree with that. I don't, but I'm a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that statement is too general to say either yes or no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. I think religion should be in the level of society and not on the level of politics. And we have a lot of uh, examples for family, for uh, what holds people together, what is uh, a, a healing remedium for fears, what is anti-totalitarian. There are so many good contributions which can uh, religions bring to a lively and human society. Yeah? But it's not every religion able for it. That is my skeptic skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think uh, in some so societies and some religion versions, religion has to do with, uh, with democracy. But in others, it doesn't have to do anything with democracy. This is why we need to be very careful when we integrate religion into, into democracy. 
Thank you very much. And maybe as I try to summarize what we were discussing during today, it may come to your direction again. Uh, I think from what I have heard from all of you, and I'm really grateful for your contributions, was that uh, we really need to differentiate many things. Uh, I was grateful to Paul, emphasizing again and again that when we say religion, we may not mean the same things by that. And we didn't have really space here for a good systematic classification of different possible meanings of religion when we speak about it. Then uh, I think uh, it's really important when we speak about the role of religion in the politics to come back to the understanding of polis, uh, of the uh, commonality, of the shared life that we speak here about. And there is not only the level of the state, but also the level of the society, which I think was another important impact of this group. Uh, then uh, we were discussing whether religion, but we need to qualify, of course, what religion is, can help social cohesion. Maybe it can, especially when it recovers the lost value of fraternity, of solidarity. And uh, as uh, it was said, uh, we need to take it wherever we find it. And maybe it may include criticism of modernity uh, by means of tradition. Uh, it can include coming uh, to the forms of solidarity which worked when religion was one factor but not the only factor. And uh, I think finally it is another theme which came uh, coming again and again, it was not reducing humanity to citizenship. And when we speak about democratic governance, we need to be aware of the fact that there are so many people who are citizens of nowhere, and we should not reduce their humanity, whether on the basis of human rights or whether on the basis of religions. So thank you very much for all your contribution and for your attention. Thank you very much.